Hey, are you golfing today? Yeah. It's the second time this week. But you said it was fine. It is fine. It's perfectly fine. Are you confused by female behavior? Wish you had a translator to understand what she means? Well, you're in luck. Introducing the Manslater, a revolutionary device that translates woman language into simple man words. Finally, the power to know what she means. Okay, cool, let me just check with my wife. Hey babe, a tea time opened up later, you mind if I go? Fine, if that's what you want to do. No go, stay home. On second thought, I think I'll just stay here with you and watch the notebook. Aw, how sweet. Now that's more like it. The Manslater uses emotion deciphering technology to help you out of the toughest jams. Thanks to the Manslater's patented FemLogic processing chip, now any man can decode statements like, Are you wearing that? You change, now. Hey, do you want to get some coffee? Me want coffee. Do you think she's pretty? You think she prettier than me? Aw, you're such a good friend. Me never date you. I'm fine. Me not fine! I'll be ready in five minutes. Me ready 30 minutes! Do whatever you want. You know do what you want. Could you rub my shoulders a little bit? No, hanky panky! Only massage! Be serious! The man's later even works on men! Finally, women can learn the deeper meaning of his words. Whoa. Your beauty is stunning. I'm fine. I'm fine, really. So get your manslater today. Clarity is just a phone call away. Well, if you don't have your manslater, I got mine. <laughs> mine says, it's stuck on this same one. It says, you know talk about wife from pulpit. <laughs> Man, we're glad you're here. Second part of a four-part series called Fix Her Upper, where we talk about fixing up the, the relationships in our life, the most important relationships in our lives. We realize that life really is all about relationships and the quality of our life has to do with the quality of the relationships that we have. Jesus was once asked, you know, what is the greatest of the laws? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so he boiled it down to this idea that we are to love God and we are to love each other. When, when Jesus uses the word neighbor, the Greek word for neighbor is plesion, which means those who are near or nearby. And so in this particular series, we're talking about not outdoor neighbors, which are the people that you meet at the ballpark or at the, at the gym or, or at, at your children's school or at work or wherever it is you run into them. We're talking about your indoor neighbors, those who are most nearby, those who are the nearest to you, your, your wife, your husband, your children, maybe your grandchildren, uh, maybe uh, it could be anybody that lives in your household, those people who see you for who you really are and know the best and the worst about you. Last week we talked about having a strong foundation and how important it is in our lives to be grounded in this strong foundation. We talked about the second law of thermodynamics and it says the natural tendency of any isolated system will degenerate into a more disordered state. Now, now to put that in plain English, as we probably will every week during the series, it means everything, if you leave it alone long enough, will get worse, not better. If you put a car in your yard, if you leave it alone long enough, it will rust, the tires will deflate, and they will dry rot. It gets worse, not better. Relationships are the same way. Relationships are all either fixer-uppers or they're falling downers. And there is nothing more important in our world than making sure that our indoor relationships, our indoor neighbors, that those relationships are the best that they can possibly be. We talked about being grounded last week, that there was a wise man who built his house on a rock. And he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like the wise man who builds his house on a rock. When rains come, the, uh, the waters rise, the winds blow, and the house stands firm. And so that's what we want. We want to take our houses, our indoor neighbors, and create a situation about fixer-uppers. Well, as you probably can tell, this lesson is about communication. It's about the things we say to one another, like the man's later. You know, uh, communication is incredibly important in every relationship, whether it's husband, wife, parent, child, 
whatever it is, those relationships and communication in those relationships are incredibly important. And we should check our wiring. When I think about uh, communication with a spouse, I think about Jeff Foxworthy. He says when his wife says we need to talk, he knows that means that she's going to talk and I'm going to listen. And I'm going to treat the conversation just like I would when a police officer pulls me over. I'm going to give them one word statements until I know what I'm being accused of. And then we'll talk. And that's kind of how it, it works sometimes in our relationships. But the Bible really talks a lot about how important relationships really are. And in Proverbs chapter 18, in verse 21, it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. It's saying that communication can add to the quality of our lives so much more than we would ever understand, and that it feeds our relationships. You know, 55% of our uh, communication is body language. That's why a lot of times I, you know, when I used to interview people for jobs, I want to be in person. That way I could see their body language, not just hear their words. But those people who love to communicate, the power of the tongue, it'll feed your relationship. And James, in James chapter 3, verse 2 and then verse 4, he says, For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, yet it boasts of great things. And in that verse of scripture, he refers to, between these things, to ships and that are, are, are steered by a small rudder and things like that. The, the tongue, communication, seems like a small thing. But words have great, great power. Now, as we've been talking about Fixer Upper, and we've been talking about Chip and Joanna Gaines, if you've seen the television show Fixer Upper, and we, we said last week the very first thing they do is check the foundation and make sure that there's a good, solid, sound foundation. But one of the other things that they do is they check the wiring in the house to make sure that the wiring is good because they know if the wiring's not good that what can happen is fires can get started and it can totally destroy the entire house. And it's the same way in our relationships. If, if the wiring is not good, if the communication is not good, it, it can start fires that will destroy our entire relationships. Now, in a house, a single phase wire looks a little bit like this. Uh, as you can see, it's got the little wire there. You've got a hot wire, ground wire, neutral wire. The hot wire is where power comes in to the circuit. It's, it's, it's how power is initiated into the circuitry within the house. Now, first, let's talk about hot wire communications. Hot wire communication uh, is, is communication where there is introduction of words, and with words, there's intention. Whenever we say anything, we have an intention behind what we're saying. Sometimes our intention is good. Sometimes our intention is selfish. Sometimes our intention is angry. And we have to realize that depending on who we're talking to, our words have different weight. Uh, for instance, uh, this is a small group Sunday, a connection Sunday. Uh, I, choose, I tend to choose small groups to be in to where they will weigh my words less than other people do. Because sometimes when I say something, people assume that I'm talking for our church. Usually I'm not. But sometimes when you say something, depending on who you are and the relationship you have, the words weigh heavy. Well, guess what? With your indoor neighbors, your words are heavy. And so when you introduce words into this community, you become that hot wire. And in communication, communication is not about what is said. It's about what is heard. It's about how communication is received. When I first started working for AT&T, the most simple thing they told us about communication is in order for communication to work, there has to be transmission and there has to be reception. If anything gets broken between transmission and reception, you do not have communication. And so realize that when we're the hot wire and we're the one introducing words into this community, this, this indoor neighbor relationship, we have to understand that it's about how they're going to hear it. Communication is not about what you say. It's about what the listener understands about what you say. No communication happens unless it is received with clarity. 
It's about what, not what about, not about what you say, but about how the listener understands what you say. Now, in my house, here's kind of the motto I, I would like for my family to think about. If I said something that could be interpreted in two ways, and one of them makes you sad or angry, I usually mean it the other way. And if I did mean it the other way, I am so sorry for the mean, awful, accurate things I said. When initiating communication, it begins, I, I want to encourage you, if you're the hot wire, when you start initiating communication into this indoor relationship the, with your indoor neighbors, begin with the end in mind. But before anything comes out of your mouth, if you have that kind of control, which is really, really hard, I want to encourage you to begin with the end in mind and, and to think, what do I want them to hear? What do I want them to do? If you want to, to begin with the end in mind, ask those two questions before anything comes out of your mouth. What do I want them to hear and what do I want them to do? There was an American poet named Patrick Delaney, and he once wrote these words. He said, think all you speak, but speak not all you think. And when we're the hot wire in this relationship and we're introducing something that, that is going to uh, have an effect in, with our indoor neighbors... We should think all we speak, but it might be wise not to speak all that we think. Well, back to the diagram, you, you've got a hot wire. You've also got a neutral wire. The neutral wire is probably one of the most important wires uh, in, in this bundle, and there's a reason for that. What this neutral wire does is it takes the power that's being introduced into the circuitry, and it redirects the power so that the rest of the circuitry can work. Uh, it, it transfers it to all the other appliances, transfers it to everything else. Uh, when you think about this neutral wire and you think about it in communication in your home, someone introduces communication into your home. How does it affect the person that you communicated with, the neutral wire? And how's it going to affect everybody that's downstream from that neutral wire? How does it affect all the other people in your home, all your other indoor neighbors? It creates a circle of power. And what we do is we, we create meaning and usefulness from this kind of communication. And when the communication comes in really, really hot, and you know what I'm talking about, angry, sarcastic, passive aggressive, how do we keep the power flowing? How do we become a neutral wire when that communication is really, really hot? Well, i got some things that I'd like to share with you. Maybe these are the ways that attitudes that we can have so that we can be a good neutral wire when someone else is introducing uh, things into our community and, and they're way, way hotter than we know how to deal with it. First, we need to look at that person with some acceptance. We need to, to be a good neutral wire in a communication. Uh, in our communication, we need to have acceptance. Therefore, accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. We can't change other people. We have to understand that whoever is introducing that communication into our world, they are what they are. I don't know how many times you've heard someone say this about a friend. is that They've said something, they've introduced something way too hot into the conversation, and someone else who is showing acceptance says, well, I know that that was hurtful, but that's just fill in the blank with a name. That's kind of the way acceptance works. We have to accept people as is. It reminds me of a story of a, a bride that was getting married, and she was really, really um, afraid about walking. She was shy, quiet, and wasn't sure she was going to make it all the way down the aisle. And so the minister told her, says, when you get up there and you start, just concentrate on the aisle. And then when you... Get further down, you, you, you concentrate on the altar. Just look at the altar and just think, don't look about all the people, just think about the aisle, and then you think about the altar. And then when you get up there, don't look at everybody else, you just think about him. And so as she walks down the aisle, she says, I'll alter him. I'll alter him. Well, if you're going into a marriage, man, I tell you what, it is as is. Hopefully, it's going to get better, but be ready to accept other people. The second thing is we need to show empathy. 
In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. You see, empathy is the ability to put yourself in someone else's place. It's the ability to to see someone else and to see a situation from a different perspective than your own. Les Parrott, who's a, a psychologist, encourages teachers that teach elementary school to, once you set your classroom up before a student ever steps in, walk around your room on your knees. Because if you walk around the room on your knees, then you will have this perspective that the children have, not the perspective that you have. And when it comes to empathy, what is the hardest part of communication for you? Because for me, I know what it is. The hardest part of communication for me is listening. You see, I, I don't know if you do this. I'm probably the only one in the room, right? But when someone's talking to me, sometimes I catch myself, instead of listening to what they're saying, I catch myself thinking about what I'm going to say next. Okay, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I bet there's someone else in this room that does that. We need to be people who, if we're going to empathize and we're going to understand someone else's perspective, we also have to be willing to listen very carefully to the things they say. And here's why. All of us have a a unique need when it comes to communication. All of us desperately need to be listened to. We desperately need to be understood And we desperately need to be taken seriously. And if we can't be listened to, understood, and taken seriously, what happens is that our life is not as full as it should be. If we don't have at least one person that will listen to us, take us seriously, and understand us, we can't live a full life, especially in the community, the indoor community that we have. So we should have acceptance. We should have empathy. Next, we should have forgiveness. Forgiveness is an important part of communication, just like it's an important part of life. Matthew 6, 14 and 15, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says these words, For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will forgive you also. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Sometimes communication just comes in way, way, way too hot. And forgiveness is going to be in order. Fires start in the circuitry in a home. Fires start when the communication is too hot and the neutral breaks. When that neutral breaks, what happens is there's nowhere for that heat to go and it creates fire in that circuitry. And it's the same way in our communications in our life. When the communication comes in way too hot and we don't have this forgiveness, what happens is the 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 neutral wire, us, the the receiver, it breaks. And so when it's too hot, it's too loud, there's an attitude, etc. Our natural reaction is to push back. And our natural reaction is to stop being neutral. And the most common response is to attack back. And when it comes to indoor neighbors, if you're an indoor neighbor and you're part of a family, husband, wife, child, a grandchild, whatever's in the house, guess what you know about those other people in the house? You know their weakest point. You know where they'll break. And guess where you're going to attack? When you stop being neutral and you start attacking back, you start attacking people at their weakest point. I used to work with this guy, and we're going to call him Joe because that's his name. And uh, Joe would, I, I once heard him talk to a guy and say, you can't talk to my wife that way. And then you ought to hear Joe talk to his wife. He's talking about coming in way too hot. He was way too hot in his communications with his wife. And, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, we wouldn't want anybody else to talk to our family the way that we talk to our family. You know, we we need to be people who are forgiving when it comes in way too hot. The the last part is encouragement. Encouragement is incredibly important in a relationship. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, therefore, encourage one another and build up one another. You know, in our house, when things get really, really tough, there are three words that seem to make everything better. Let's eat out. Now, I love you. 
And, and there are words in our life that are incredib- incredibly important. And online I found this list. It's called Life's Most Meaningful Words. I want to read them to you. I love you. You're wonderful. It's benign. War is over. It's a boy. It's a girl. Thank you. All is forgiven. God bless you. Welcome home. Good morning. Merry Christmas. I found that one odd. You passed the test. I didn't find that one odd. You're right. I do. You're hired. Will you, will you marry me? And I believe you. It's funny how words have great deal of power. You know, words are so powerful that there was a time in the history of man that to be able to write was considered evil. That, that the ability to draw words because of the power within words was, was equivalent to divination, to witchcraft. And that's why even to the day, I don't know if you know this or not, that's why we call writing words or drawing words spelling. Because at one time it was considered casting spells in order to be able to write words. Words powerful. Well, in James 3, as we continue on, it says, So also the tongue is a small part of the body, yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. I have an illustration here, and I just thought it'd be kind of fun to do this. All of our lives are like dry wood, all of our relationships. And sometimes, instead of choosing acceptance and empathy, forgiveness, encouragement, we douse them with harsh actions. And then we stand back. You ready for this, Paul? Anger. Wait, that didn't work. (laughs) Passive aggressiveness. Hatefulness. Now can't even get the match to light. Y'all didn't think I'd really put gasoline in there, did you? That's apple juice. It's good, too. My point is this. If all our relationships are just right on the edge of being able to go up and smoke, you've got two choices. You can cover them in sweetness, or you can cover them in an accelerant. And the tongue is a fire. It's able to do good. It's able to do bad. Why don't you choose good? Why don't you choose to, to douse your relationship in sweetness, the sweetness of acceptance, the sweetness of empathy, the sweetness of forgiveness, the, the sweetness of encouragement, rather than to douse your relationship in anger and passive aggressiveness, revenge. You see, it's important that we be good neutral wires. L- last part of this lesson is, is about the third wire, the ground wire. You know, we're talking about the hot wire. That introduces power into the circuitry. The neutral wire spreads it out to the other parts of the circuit. The neutral wire breaks, you got a fire. But you also have a ground wire. And and a ground wire is incredibly important. It's an an additional path that safely returns the power that can't be handled by the neutral wire back to the earth. If you see a diagram and you see a a thing called PE, that stands for protective earth. That's that's the ground wire. And, And a lot of times in our lives, though, we don't think it through when it comes to the ground wire. I remember when I was in college, uh, our dorm room looked like a fire prevention uh, video. Really, our dorm room looked a little like this. If you remember this from Christmas vacation, there was uh, the, uh, 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 Griswold was wiring up his house and that's kind of how it looked. But you know, a lot of times what happens is, is that we have a plug that looks like this. It's got three little prongs. This prong here is your ground prong. And so we want to have an extension cord. We, it's not long enough. And so what we do is we take one of these that only has two, and we cut that little tab off at the top, 
And we do this. And you're not grounded. And so if the neutral wire can't handle the power that comes through, guess what? There's no grounding in this circuitry. There's no grounding in your relationship. And fires start. Destruction happens. We ignore this wiring. You see, the way to prevent total destruction in our conversations with indoor neighbors is to make sure that we're grounded properly. It's to make sure that maybe it's coming in too hot. Maybe we're not not able to handle all of what's happening with that heat as a neutral wire. And we need to make sure that there's some grounding in the life of our indoor neighborhood. Fire start when we're not properly grounded. Let's go back and look at Matthew chapter 7. It says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and floods came, the wind blew, slammed against that house, and it did not fall for it had been founded in the rock. We need to ground our families in Jesus so that when something's too hot or the neutral wire breaks, there's something else to hold this this, this community together. There's something else to take that load so that we don't burn everything down around us. Grounding begins when we realize that we must intentionally choose Jesus. You want to ground your family? Here's some ideas. Be at church. And you're thinking, well, you know, being being in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than being in a garage makes you a car. Well, that may be true. But being in church is important. The average American who considers himself a regular churchgoer goes twice a month. You want to be average? The world's got enough average people. Be in church and have your family with you. Second thing, be in a small group. We need community. We need outdoor community. And sometimes that outdoor community can help us deal with our indoor community. If you're not in a small group, you need to find a small group where you can communicate and you can, can, can connect with other people. Because being in that community will help you with your indoor wiring. It will help you with your indoor relationships. If you don't believe me, online there's a, there was a panel discussion this past Wednesday night here with some of our small group leaders. You need to go watch that. It's important. Why? Because they all talked about how that outdoor community helped their indoor life. Be in a, be in a small group. Serve with your family. Be, be out in the community and, and not, don't just serve on your own. Serve with your family. And more than anything else, show kindness. Just be kind in your home. Show the kindness of Jesus Christ, how he was someone who accepted us, how he's someone that shows empathy for us. He forgives, he encourages, be that kind of person. This grounding happens when every day we wake up in the morning and we say the words of the Apostle Peter. You know, Jesus had gone out and he had sent his his disciples out and they came back and they were all thrilled to death. This is in Matthew 16. He said, who, who do they say I am? Well, some say you're one thing, some say you're another. Some say you're a prophet, some say you're Elijah. Who do you say I am? In verse 16, Peter says, I believe you're the Christ, son of the living God. You want to ground your life, wake up every morning saying, I believe he's the Christ, the son of the living God, and I'm going to treat my indoor rela- relationships and my indoor neighbors with acceptance and empathy and forgiveness and encouragement. My words will be sweet, and I vow not to burn my house down around me. Check your wiring. It's important. Let's pray together. God, you're amazing. We thank you for this day and the love that you show us. May we be people who show that love to the people who are closest to us. Strengthen us, guide us, and allow us to have the humility to follow you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.